Okay, hello everyone. Uh, Lassiting, who is a professor of blockchain information systems at the University of Arkansas in America. And uh, I will hand over to Mary to invite other uh, panelists to, to introduce themselves and then start the session. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nakvi. You must be getting tired. You've been in every session up early. So thank you so much to you and to the British Blockchain Association for uh, the opportunity to participate again. I, I had a great time last year as well. Welcome to the future of enterprise blockchains. I'm so excited to have these three leaders and chief architects of basic um, protocols and um, actual technologies geared towards enterprise adoption of blockchain solutions. So I'm gonna, um, we'll go around Robin. We're gonna begin with uh, Brian and Richard, and then we'll welcome John Wolpert. He's actually in another meeting. He'll be joining us as soon as he can. So, Brian, can you just briefly introduce yourself and tell us what your role is in this space? Sure. Um, so, Brian Bellendorf, uh, my overall title at the Linux Foundation is General Manager for Blockchain, Healthcare, and Identity. Because uh, in, uh, in the last few months, uh, these different threads have woven together in some interesting ways. In that capacity, I serve as Executive Director for Hyperledger, a role that I've had since uh, early 2016, really, as well as now Executive Director for Linux Foundation Public Health, uh, which is leading uh, some of the work on vaccine credentials and the like. Uh, and yeah, lots more to say, but I'll hold it to that. Okay, great, Brian. Thank you. Hi, Richard. Welcome. Can you please tell the audience a little bit about you? Yeah, hi. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. So I'm Richard Brown, Chief Technology Officer at R3. Uh, I led the team that designed and brought to market um, Corda, the, one of the uh, major open source enterprise blockchains, um, and potentially relevant, and we may get onto this, I also led the team that brought to market earlier this year, Coldclave, uh, which is a confidential company. Okay, great, Richard, thank you. And uh, John Wolpert, when he joins, he's got a really interesting addition to this conversation because he had his career at IBM. He was one of the architects of Hyperledger Fabric, which is one of your projects, Brian. And now he works at um, Consensus and is gonna be talking a little bit more about public adoption. So what we're really gonna try to do here today is answer some of the big questions about enterprise adoption where we are today, talk about public versus uh, private blockchains and where we're going to go in the future. So, Brian, I think you're going to you're going to go first and you're going to share with us the view of private permissioned enterprise blockchains and um, share with us what you're doing in that space. Sure. So uh, for the last five years, Hyperledger has been uh, perhaps the only uh, uh, consortium that has really uh, been out there talking about the advantages uh, from a technology and a movement point of view of looking at the other end of the distributed ledger space, uh, which is not focused on ICOs and, and speculative financial instruments as the driver for consensus mechanisms or burning CPU, CPU power wantonly, that sort of thing. But instead for saying, if you're going to have a consortium of organizations converging on a common system of record uh, uh, without uh, or with with governance rules about how uh, entries get updated about how business processes get implemented in a, in a decentralized way but where there's still a role for governance human governance of of that consortium and a role for kind of a, a badging in a certificate authority you know a kind of uh, uh, interface for being able to say look who we are as a consortium there's uh, both technical connections between us and legal connections now, between us. it looks like um, Brian uh connection is buffering sorry am i am i okay or am i yeah i, I can, can, you, I can hear you fine okay thank you um so i uh, just to keep no, going so so in those five years connected sorry um should i keep going no um hang on for a second i'm sorry i i hear brian fine are you saying um Dr. Yeah, Solomon, is not. Brian's, Brian's fine. I can hear him and see him. Brian is fine. fine. Brian is fine, Solomon. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you, can, can you hear him? 
Okay, thanks. Um, so, so in the last five years, Hyperledger's grown in a pretty, pretty nice clip. Uh, uh, we have uh, Fabric now uh, running uh, underneath uh, so many of the different, con well, you know, marquee consortia that are out there. You know, it's really hard to get n numbers on this to the degree that satisfies people who spend their day hitting reload on Coin Market Cap and getting, you know, the price of different tokens to ten decimal points. Uh, instead, uh, you look to, to data such as the Forbes Blockchain Fifty Survey that recently went out, which showed uh, of the 50 different billion dollar revenue companies uh, that they profiled, more than half of those deploying Hyperledger Fabric. And if you count the other Hyperledger projects underneath our wing, 60% uh, uh, of those organizations running some form of Hyperledger technology underneath. Um, and, and that's really fun to see. And that's, that's in production, right? Um, and so, uh, it's, uh, you know, the the enterprise blockchain space has obviously grown to the point where you can point to projects like Food Trust and say there's hundreds of organizations involved in that, either directly running nodes themselves or calling into it through APIs through other partners who are running those networks. Uh, but still hard to get a size of the bread box kind of kind of sense for it. The uh, uh, the and and meanwhile on the public ledger side, full credit to uh, uh, you know the companies that have been building enterprise applications in that domain, such as Consensus. Yeah. You know who have also uh, stepped forward with uh, a software platform called uh, Hyperledger Bezu, which is the Java version of what the work that they brought in from uh, a kind of uh, as a as a say a compare uh, a, com a uh, partner to the Quorum technology stack that they brought in from J.P. Morgan, uh, uh, which can be used both for the Ethereum mainnet as well as for uh, consortia based or permission blockchains. Full credit to them for, to thinking for thinking about ways in which these two worlds can come together. Um, but even some of the the, the fabric-based blockchain networks are fence posting, you know, checksums into uh, different public blockchain ledgers as a way to attest the integrity of the data that's being shared on a private basis. Um, from the very beginning, we've said that there will be a spectrum of technologies, a spectrum of approaches to the size of your uh, blockchain network here and to the, the choice of technologies that you choose to use. Uh, and I see uh, organizations who are a couple of years into deploying these technologies saying, we're not just going to deploy one protocol, one technology stack, just for the same reason they don't only use one database. You know, they don't only use, uh, one, you know, optionality has some value still in in this, in the, in this space. Um, uh, and I'll say that's a reason why we've uh, also focused efforts on something called Hyperledger Cactus, which is an, an interoperability and uh, integration platform for pulling, being able to conduct transactions across different ledgers of different different styles, different approaches, uh, and and using that as a way to talk to the public blockchain seems like a very straightforward thing to do. Um, I, I'll just end with you know while we've seen companies adopting Bitcoin into their treasuries and uh, certainly lots of the banks starting to introduce custodial services for. Uh, uh, for public blockchain digital assets and that sort of thing. I still stand by my prediction that most of the commercial transactions of the world will happen over permission blockchains, um, uh, whether for data privacy reasons and data residency requirements, meeting requirements of the GDPR, those sorts of things, uh, and uh, uh, you know performance reasons, all the sorts of things you might add into there. And those, uh, many of those networks will continue to anchor or use resources from the public networks. Uh, and I think that that will increase. Uh, and most companies will have to learn how to be comfortable with, with both kinds of uh, uh, modes uh, as time goes on. Great, Brian, thank you. Uh, Richard, before you go, since John was able to join us, John, thank you so much. I know you, you can't buy locate yet. And you just got out. Of, you just got out of chairing another session for another conference. So, so welcome. Could you just briefly introduce yourself to the audience? You're on mute, my dear. Uh, so I am. Yes. <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, sorry, I'm late. Yeah, I was uh, chairing. I'm, I'm the chair of the uh, baseline protocol um, uh, technical steering committee, and we just got out of our our. Uh, by by monthly meeting, which uh, I can't get out of. So uh, I'm I'm glad that we had two esteemed speakers uh, uh, carrying the load. Uh, 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 so uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Okay, we'll get to uh, your talking points after uh, Richard. So John, thank you. All right, Richard, talk to us. The future of enterprise blockchains, but you're on mute too. 
I actually clicked it as well, but I clicked the wrong button. So, uh, so the future of enterprise blockchains. Uh, what I thought I'd do was first maybe a slight compare and contrast because there are so many similarities between what we're doing in the Corda community with, with, with what's happening in, in the Hyperledger community, but also one or two differences. So I thought maybe for the, the viewers and listeners, um, I'd just not give a whole history lesson, but talk a little bit about our, our journey to this point because it, it may it may cast some light on, on the different paths we've been taking um, and some of the similarities. So, so as, as many of the viewers may know, um, there are three that the firm behind Corda. We didn't begin as a software firm. You know, today, we are a software firm. Corda is, is an open source platform, but it's an open core model and you know, we're the firm that, that stands behind it. Um, but we didn't begin that way. We, we, we began as a consortium and a consortium, um, so sort of crucially, of, of large banks. So, so the beginning back in 2015, was, was this belief there were many large financial institutions who had this collective belief that there was something to this blockchain thing. Um, but if we were to figure out what it was or what it might be, um, what's the point of everybody figuring this out separately when it was already obvious at that point that to the extent there's anything to this, it's about network technologies, it's about multiple firms cooperating. So let's work together to figure it out. Um, long story short, um, it was really, really quite sort of riotously um, sort of creative and you know, quite stressful process at the same time in 2015, 16, 17, as, as we worked through um, you know, the questions about you know, what is genuinely new about this technology, what is the relevance to, to large businesses. And, and coming out of that, and I, I hope, I think this is something with which all speakers would, would agree, is that we, we, we identified that this idea of multiple firms who want to transact being able to do so in a way that assures they know what the other party sees, that they see the same thing, they're following the same process, and they can move to a world where they are you know, ever, ever more closer in synchronization. You know, that is surely a direction in which we should try to take the world. And some of the technologies and some of the concepts underpinning the public in the permissionless blockchains um, showed us what was possible and showed us the way. Um, I'm sure we'll get onto this as we talk about the differences, but we 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 made the or we we came to the conclusion that there was there was an unmet need related to solving this problem in a regulated space, in a regulated sphere, where there was a strong concept of identity, finality, where there was a way to write the business logic in languages with which modern developers were familiar, and so we began the journey that led to Corda. Like I say, Corda was was open source. The um, Corda community is large and growing. Um, I think um, now, of course, you know, there are different statistics you can look at, um, but the most recent um, Gartner report, industry analyst, suggested that over 40%, 40% of, of, um, of, of, of large deployed enterprise blockchain platforms are doing so on Corda. And, um, and it's, been, yeah, it's been a really exciting and, um, and I guess, successful journey. And to give one example to make it, uh, make it concrete, because this may also then set up a conversation later for where things go, let's just take one live example um, that is being done on Corda, which is in Italy, um, you know, in Europe, um, the Spunter project. And this one is fascinating because literally 90 plus percent, I think it's north of 90 percent of Italy's banks are now live on a network um, managed by Corda, where each of these banks either has their own node installed or is using one hosted by the, um, the Italian Banking Association to enable each of the bank's branches to reconcile with the branches of all the other banks in, in the country to ensure that they're in sync and that when one bank thinks they owe some money to the other one or that they hold a balance with the other one, that the figures on their systems actually do line up with the, system, the figures on the other systems. You could say, well, why do you need something like an, an enterprise blockchain to do that? Um, well, the, the thing I point to is, well, what were they doing beforehand? And it was a very laborious, manually intensive process um, that took days and days and days, and it's now concluded in minutes. And I think the reason reason for that is you could have imagined a technological solution to this, but before technologies like Corda or Hyperledger or Ethereum came along, that technological solution would have had to have been run by a single firm hosted in a data center somewhere, um, with you know, so representing both from a risk perspective, a single point of failure, but from a control perspective, that organization would have been extraordinarily painful. Instead, we see an almost unbundling of control in this model. Somebody still has to write the code, somebody has to verify it, somebody has to bring everybody together. But the actual runtime of this, the actual communication, the actual day-to-day -day operation, it's bilateral, it's point-to-point, -point. it's one bank contacting another one without relying on any central infrastructure or requiring the permission of the central operator. So I think that, that unbundling of the different aspects of control and power is what made it possible and allowed them to move from a paper-based system. So there's a lot more I could talk about, but this idea of enabling you know, 
parties in the market, firms in the market who are competitive and distrustful, but who need to collaborate, who need to be able to transact with each other, to do so in a way that's ever more efficient, ever more in synchrony, is kind of what's at heart of this, the heart of this space, I think. Um, and I you was know, speaking to Mike Hearn, who was the lead engineer of Corda, and, um, and he's saying, yep, you know, I always predicted this was a 10-year journey, and we're five years through, so we're you know, halfway there, and you know, a lot done, a lot still to do. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Richard. So I love this panel is just really rock stars, right? So we've got the three major enterprise adoptions that people are taking today. We have Hyperledger Fabric represented by Brian's organization. We have Quarter represented by Richard Brown. And then John, I bragged about you before you were able to join. You basically were the architect of Hyperledger Fabric. I thought you were when you were at IBM. You got on mute. Yeah, that pesky I mute button. had a lot to do with fabric. Am I incorrect about that? Oh, I, I wouldn't call myself the architect. There were too many other good people. <laughs> uh, in fact, I think uh, Richard could claim some uh, some uh, some some credit here. Uh, Richard was on the IBM team before uh, Corda, and uh, as we were forming uh, the ideas that went into Hyperledger Fabric. But no, I mean there are people like Gary Singh and Chris Ferris and so many other people that uh, no, I, I had a hand in it. Uh, all the bad stuff about fabric I did. And oh, I, okay. Well, I'll ask Richard what, what, what your real contribution, because you're a very modest man. But you're here today to talk to us from, from your new role at uh, Consensus. So what is the future of blockchain uh, enterprises? Uh, well, gosh, uh, um, I've been at Consensus now since 2017. Um, was uh, at IBM on the Hyper, one of the founders of the Hyperledger project. Um, and... Uh, I came to a different conclusion. So I think uh, in, in some ways uh, I wish that and I had some, something to do with the naming fabric, I think uh, came out of something I was talking about the name fabric. I was running around trying to convince people like Corda to join the Hyperledger project by saying, no, it's a fabric. It's not the, a platform. It's a fabric. It's below the platform. It's more boring. Now we wound up building a platform. Uh, <laughs> It is absolutely 100% of platform now, um, but uh, that was why we call it Fabric. And in fact, there's a guy named Mark Parzignac that right named the repo Fabric, and that's why it's called Fabric. Didn't go through marketing or anything like that. It's just it's a technical guy who just wrote the you know the the put the word Fabric into the repo, and the, it just kind of took a life from there. Um, so uh, that's one of the projects in Hyperledger is Fabric, and I think one of the first ones. So, um, but it, I, I sort of wish that we'd called it shared database or shared state machine, uh, because then uh, managers can under, understand what, what we're getting involved with. Um, a shared state machine involves lots of different companies having um, uh, either a full node or, or a peer, as we call them in Fabric. And uh, then you have to do a lot of complex stuff to create compartmentalization. Corda does a pretty good job of this compartmentalization, but in, in by that same token, I almost don't think of Corda as a blockchain. And, and, and you know, I, I remember back in the early days, they said, hey, we're not a blockchain, we're useful. And I'm like, yeah, that was always a good, I, th I thought that was the right marketing because Corda is useful. Yeah, I just don't think of it as a blockchain. Um, I think of it as, as, a, as more of a messaging layer and a good one. Um, so, and I, by the way, Richard, I hope you're talking about what the, this new project that you're doing is quite interesting. This uh, uh, confidential compute work. Yeah, I, I hope we come on to that. That's yeah. quite yeah. exciting. Yeah, I hope you talk about yeah. that because um, that's, I think, where it's at. So I think uh, you said before, um, one of the comments earlier was what you know, we need. In fact, I think, Richard, you were elaborating on this, that, that we need to be able to be confident that um, we are all in sync, right? That, that I have the same information that you have, and certainly in workflows. Uh, the, the number of screw-ups that happen between companies trying to work together is prodigious, and it generates enormous disruption. Um, people just not getting paid at the end of the day. Right? So supply, you know, people at the whipsaw back end of a supply chain that aren't getting paid for uh, a long time because of disputes that are happening up that chain. There's a lot of consistency issues. Now, there are two ways of thinking about that. One is to have a single source of truth, um, you know, a shared database or a shared state machine that says, yep, we're all looking at this one thing, and that one thing is, is, the, is, the, is the canonical source of truth. The problem with that approach is that it also creates a giant honeypot. 
uh, now you have system in, uh, system administrators from in companies who do not work for you, who you rely upon to not screw up and get hacked by Mr. Robot and out you all. Now that you can use uh, encryption and you can have end-to-end -end encryption and et cetera. And with IBM's case, we said, yeah, don't worry about it. We'll run it. We'll, we'll run all your nodes on our mainframes. Well, at that point, I'm like, yeah. And it, you could probably have built it better, stronger, faster with Mongo or something or, or Postgres or something. You didn't really need um, a blockchain. Um, uh, the, the baseline protocols uh, foundation, and by the way, baseline protocol really is not a platform. It is a standard. It's under the Oasis uh, Foundation standards process. It has some reference implementations, but that is not the game. The game is is to basically say we all need three prong output uh, outlets and and uh, two 240 volts and we need to do things similarly. So SAP is involved, uh, Microsoft is involved, and uh, now about a thousand people and companies that are working actively on the standard and the uh, reference implementations. And the idea is that you know baselining is um, is a standard practice for how state machines or databases in respective companies traditional systems of record can maintain consistency, not by put it, moving their data to a new uh, threat surface, um, but rather by saying, no, leave it in SAP, leave it in Dynamics, leave it in uh, NetSuite. And we will use a shared state machine only as a consistency check between those systems. So that, that's it, that, that's, that, that blockchain doesn't know anything about the data or the business relationships or the activities going on. All it knows is I've got a, a proof, a hash, that is a proof of consistency between my record and your record. So uh, my purchase order is verifiably identical to the purchase order that is supposed to be the same in your system. We didn't put it on a new blockchain. So uh, the, I guess the punchline here is from our perspective, data for databases. Databases are still a wonderful technology. And um, hashes or proofs, and ordering for blockchains. Um, and when you when you look at it that way, you say, well, there's always on tamper resistant state machine called a public blockchain, Ethereum, for example, that uh, you can use to store those Merkle trees full of proofs. And if you do it correctly, you do it in such a way that nobody could you applying like a, a powerful AI could ascertain anything about you, your relationships or your business activities by analyzing those events. So in that case, why why pay a million bucks to set up a new integration bus between you and your partners when there's one that's always on and running that you don't have to pay to, to set up? That's the baseline approach. Okay. Richard, did you want to respond to something that John said? You were shaking your head. Oh, I, I wasn't intending to shake my head. So um, so a, a couple of things immediately. Well, thank you. So a couple of things to, to respond to. So um, I, I, I totally agree with um, um, John about the, you know, I guess success has many parents. So, um, you know, certainly with Cordra, I always say, you know, I, was the, I, I led the team that designed and brought it to market because it just wouldn't be true to say I was the one who designed it. So I, I have to come up with a different formulation. Um, you know, I, I, I joke, and maybe this is where I was shaking my head, when when, when John talked about um, you know, Cordra's role, Cordra's design, and, and it, it, its nature as a blockchain. Um, I can probably say this now, but um, but there was a there was definitely a difficult time, I forget exactly when it was, when if you look at the design of Cordra, Cordra does not share all data with everybody, exactly as John says, you know, we, we start with the idea that you know, we're trying to synchronize data between two or more parties who should have that information and have a legitimate need to see it. So we so we have like the messaging identity, the workflow and all those things, and it ensures those parties are in sync. Um, because we allow, and I guess you know, maybe the one thing I take exception with on, on John's characterization of it, of, of these platforms as shared databases is the core smart contract concept is still in there. So I, I can in my core database, if that's what one were to call it, say, you know, here's, here are some rows that I want to be in sync with other people. But I can attach constraints. I can attach rules that say, "Oh well, by the way, if other people can make these smart contracts run successfully, then they can update my copy without my permission." So there is that sort of decentralized and delegation aspect. But sure. I, I freely admit, I, mean, I, I got into a lot of trouble with our marketing team, and hopefully there's no one from them on the, on the dialed in here. You know, a few years back, because I went around saying Corda is not a blockchain, and I was I was saying that as as an engineer because we have lots and lots of chains of transactions, but we don't batch them up into, into blocks. Um, but what happened, of course, is there's the engineering view of the world, which is, you know, what are the data structures and how do they hang together? And then there's the concept of market category. You know, what market category are you in? Who do you compete with? What problems do you solve? 
I mean, you speak to industry analysts or customers doing RFPs and things, you know, they use enterprise blockchain to, to, to meet a category, which is software platforms that can be used to synchronize data between different firms. And that absolutely is where Corner sits. So I had to sort of get comfortable with being impure from an engineering perspective in order to help people understand what it is we actually built. So, uh, yeah. so I don't, I'd agree with that. Um, with respect to... Um, Baseline, um, it, it's good that John's on here. I, I, I need to take an action to go and look at that again because I know, John, we've done several podcasts on it and together. And, and the bit I was always because tr- uh, uh, the bit I was always unclear on was you know, I, it, 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 how could I disagree with it because it's, it's, such, it's such a compelling concept. I never understood why you then needed to put stuff on the blockchain because you could do it peer to peer. Oh, but yeah, you, but, could, but you could, you could put it, it on an Arduino on in your yeah. closet. Yeah. You just wouldn't yeah. have interop between different workflows. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. you'd have to yeah. set that up, right? That's the whole point. Yeah. Uh, okay, gentlemen. So part of the reason why we're here at the British Blockchain Association is their their real mantra, you can see it up here, is advocating evidence-based uh, research in this area. So I was asked to kind of present our evidence from the research we've done at the University of Arkansas. I'm going to jump to my findings and I'm going to have you all chime in as to whether these resonate with your experiences or not. All right. So just to give you a little background on our research. I'm gonna share my screen. I wanna just do my application window here. Okay, all right. So a little bit about the um, background of what we do at the Blockchain Center of Excellence here. We're primarily looking at very large enterprises and how they are adopting this technology. And we do a kind of one detailed case study at a time. So for example, we just did a real, um, about, a, you know, about a 30 page paper on DL Freight, which is the solution that was uh, developed by Walmart Canada and DLT Labs for freight um, invoicing. We've looked at public adoptions by enterprises like the ANSA check delu- uh, solution. ANSA is one of the large news wires in Italy developed with EY. And so looking across um, over a dozen applications that are live, that are u- being used today, these are some of the findings we had, and, I, and I'd love for you to chime in and tell me what your thoughts are. One, even though we're technologists on this phone, that's not the hard part. The hard part is the ecosystem. And that most of these solutions that are in today, you know, they started a couple years ago and blockchain was just a backstory. They were trying to solve ecosystem level challenges. And it was oftentimes the technology provider that said, hey, blockchains would be a good enabling technology to um, get rid of these pain points in the ecosystems for you. Uh, Many of you have already talked about this, but the early adopters that are enterprises are choosing private blockchains over public blockchains. They really only have one example of a public blockchain, but that may change in the future. Um, I think there's a lot going on with scalability, with zero knowledge proofs, with uh, trusted computing environments that may change. So before I rattle them all off, I'm just going to stop with these three. Um, And maybe Brian, you maybe Brian, you want to chime in first? Is this what you're seeing in your experiences with enterprises? If it's counter, that's fine. Just, you know, whatever's whatever triggers, whatever triggers your thoughts. Yeah, the, the, uh, these three all match. Um, certainly, uh, if you're launching a consortium, you don't want lead. You don't want to lead with a story that, hey, we're doing it with blockchain, and that's why it's cool. No, instead, it should be an implementation detail. Uh, but the point is, you want to avoid setting up a central database and appointing somebody to play god on that system. So, uh, right now, blockchains, especially as Richard has helpfully said, is now taken on this term well beyond the technical underpinning kind of data structure underneath. Makes sense. Um, the ecosystems are hard part. The blockchains are easy part. Actually, speaks to something. John said, you know, it doesn't take a million dollars to set up a uh, permission blockchain uh, uh, bus, you know, in terms of numbers of nodes or even the technical staff required to do that. That's an order to a magnitude higher than you really need. Uh, What is harder is the governance models. And that's uh, going to be equally hard whether you're doing things like this on a permissioned or or permissionless kind of system. So uh, Dolly back there, and I've got more to say on that, but I want to keep the conversation flowing. Okay, let me rattle off three more and then maybe Richard or John can, can uh, go with that. So one of the things that we talk about, we want all this transparency, but our experience has been, I wanna see your data, but I don't want you to see mine. And in reality, a lot of times these blockchain solutions aren't sharing that much additional data that they weren't sharing in a traditional way with like EDI. And they're really seeing that it's being used as a mutable proof that events occurred, but not sharing a lot of data. So I'll toss that one out there. 
Another one is it, we've got to design solutions that really minimize change management because all of these typically get integrated with their back office ERP systems or transportation management systems. So the easy onboarding is huge and that you have to create business value for each participant type. So the minimal viable ecosystem is often there because they see potential value, but in order to get network effects, you're gonna to have to think of different incentives models to get the end-to-end -end solution. So I'll pause there. I'd and love to take that one if I could. Okay, go ahead, John. Yeah, so I, I think that's exactly right. Change management is uh, hard. In fact, I have, uh, have a relative that's in change management and they say, you know, a person can change, but people never do. So, uh, you know, the change management is, is, is something that really, if you wanna do that uh, quickly and effectively, you have to have a new company. Um, you know, existing companies of organizations of humans, uh, they, they tend not to change. Um, and so you, 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 that's why uh, the baseline approach is, is one that, that appeals to me is that, you know, you've got an SAP system, great, keep it. Don't change anything. Yeah, you know, you know, bolt a, a little crud, crud, crud layer on the side of it um, and, uh, and then don't move the data, data out of it. So your CISO isn't losing their mind over uh, uh, where, what, what are, where are you sending our data? No. Um, so I, I, in the early days of blockchain, uh, enterprise blockchain, you know, I was able to go and talk to anybody and say, hey, you know, blockchain will it'll make it better for you and uh you we, we want to share data you know full, uh, transparency supply chain by the way nobody really wants transparency you know i was talking to uh, i think it was walmer uh you know the saying well w w why are you doing this fabric thing i'm like well they're like for, for transparency and i said really because you work with homeland defense i'm pretty sure you don't want everybody to know where all of our food is you want the right people to know at the right time under the right conditions. And ideally you want them to not know it anymore when they aren't supposed to know it anymore. Databases are really good at that. Blockchains are digital nudist colonies. They're terrible at that. Um, you know, you, and you've got a big threat surface. So uh, in, in the case of, um, you know, change management, yeah, leave it in your database and then, and then use a blockchain private or public um, to effectively, uh, uh, anchor those events in an immutable layer that says whatever is in on, on these databases, it's that it's that thing, um, and and uh, and that way you get the the tamper resistance of a ideally a public blockchain, the most tamper resistant kind of blockchain, and the surveillance resistance of a of a of a database. Excellent, thank you, John. So that means Richard, you get to comment on our last two findings. And by the way, this just came out in Sloan Management Review. It's in, in the issue this month. You, you can also get it online or in a, or in a newsstand near you. So this one I think was really interesting. The enterprise um, case studies that we did, of all of them we looked at, only one of them really got rid of a trusted third party. Um, they all pretty much rely on trusted third parties, but they play different roles now. They're not in the middle of transactions validating at the transaction level. They're really more at like a managed service level, um, more in doing things like operating the network nodes or protecting digital wallets on behalf of clients or enforcing access rules set up um, for the governance or managing the software updates. And then the last one is it's pretty obvious that a lot of these first generation solutions will need to evolve. And in particular, um, you know, these companies that have adopted these solutions, they know that they're not just gonna have one ecosystem, something that Brian had mentioned, and they're very interested in the ability to share these assets across different platforms. Okay, so I'll pause there, Richard. Yeah, so maybe take that the trusted third party one because that, that ties in both to the, the previous point, number six, about creating value and, and also the point I, I was making with respect to um, the, the Corda project in Italy. Um, and the, the the thing that I guess we certainly we learned and I was glad that we learned it early because it could have been existential had we not, is, is an obvious insight, but it doesn't seem obvious when you come from a kind of decentralized or sort of like you know, true believer world as, as, you know, as I, I certainly did at the start. And then that insight is if you're going to, you know, if you're going to effect change, you know, effect with an E, if you're going to make something happen at the level of a market or, or, or you know, amongst multiple participants in an industry, that, it's, it's obvious, but you have to say it. There has to be something in it for everybody. You know, if you're doing something that will eliminate an existing party or make it harder for them to make money or make it harder for them to serve their customers, guess what? They're going to resist that. They, so the so the successful projects are the ones, and it takes real sort of like you know, care and attention and crafting by the, by the people bringing these things together. The really successful projects are ones that have identified something that is, is a net positive for everybody involved and by extension, the customers and clients of those people who are involved. 
So that then when you get to the um, the trusted third party thing, well, if there's an existing trusted third party who you're trying to take out, you know, that's, that's just, that's just not, that's just, you know, that's, that's just, that's just naive to think that would happen. Um, the interesting thing with, with the, um, the sponsor project was when you try to unbundle the, the, the role of, of these parties, sometimes it, 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 this technology then allows you to, to, to achieve something that was otherwise impossible. So this is, this is a technological solution that didn't exist and now did because you never would have been allowed a new trusted third party to be created that does everything, but to do just the parts that need to be centralized with everything else done peer to peer, that, that really, really helps. Um, so so I, I agree with that. No, there's just, like, just you know, incentives matter, incentives drive everything and when, it, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you get to the end, end of this. Maybe just really quickly on one point that, that John mentioned, and, and I, I won't spend too long on this because I know we're short of time, but John may, may mentioned this point about you know, sometimes you, 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 you or maybe always, you don't want your data to be visible to somebody else unless they've got a legitimate need to know. Frankly, that, that, that's what led to the design and then the shipping of, of Conclave, you know, our second product, because as we were working with all these, these large consortia building, building networks, you know, the primary initial use case was, how can we synchronize data that should be synchronized to make sure it's in sync? But for every project like that we discovered, there were always other requirements on top that had so many common things, so many things in common. You know, we, we need to be able to connect to each other, communicate, execute workflows, transact. But they absolutely, you know, I agree with John on this, did not want the data to be synchronized. Instead, everybody had almost like they had their view of the market. They knew what their sales were or they knew what their customers were doing. And there were all these use cases coming out where they, they needed to almost achieve the impossible, which was to bring these data sets together to, to, to derive some insight, you know, figure out, you know, find sort of patterns of fraud or whatever it is. But they wanted the data to be brought together, but they wanted nobody, nobody at all to ever have, you know, no human to have sight of the whole data set or to be able to subvert the execution. Um, and, and so, you know, what I'm describing there is, is what the, the concept of confidential computing allows. Um, and, and Conclave is an example of a platform that delivers that. But it's, it's just interesting to me about you know, watching what clients are doing and then realizing that you're solving one problem for them, but actually there are lots of other very similar adjacent problems that aren't quite the same, but we Well, what I'm surprised not to see in this list of eight is the um, regulatory uh, pressures to adopt these technologies as a driver for uh, forging these kind of uh, consortia. Um, I mean, almost every every use case I've seen has involved meeting some regulatory requirement as the reason to set up a system like this, uh, uh, whether it's traceability in supply chains, whether it's reporting in the insurance industry, uh, you know, whether it's, it's, you know, all these different functions, that that is a, a large value and it's a cost center it's not a revenue center for any of these companies it's a cost center and it's um, you know if you can bring down the cost of being able to satisfy different regulations that should play a major role in incentivizing everybody to participate, even if it doesn't confer a competitive advantage to any one party, right? Uh, and and figuring out how to quantify that benefit uh, is, I, I think, a struggle. It's e much easier to point to new revenue, uh, I, you know, that that, uh, that the adoption of new technologies tends to generate. Uh, it's also hard sometimes to point to the mitigation of risk, which, I mean, some companies do that really well, arguably insurance companies uh, do or, or claim to at least, but most companies are really poor at figuring out how do I quantify the advantage of containing uh, outside risks that that really better tr visibility into uh, into these systems gives me and gives gives my uh, my own customers right so um, I would suggest some research into that uh, and then secondly we've not really talked a lot about the governance models that consortia use that are built around these different platforms they tend to be uh, uh, bootstrapped on top of an existing company whether large or small acting as that certificate authority acting as that uh, the entity that badges in the participants, but could it may, uh, uh, or if it is an existing consortium, they're probably not technically savvy because they're used to driving specifications development rather than um, being responsible for helping run a, a living, breathing network. Um, I can, you know, outside of the blockchain space, the type of organizations that tend to do this uh, well are organizations like ICANN, which helps manage the domain name system. They don't do it in the blockchain setting, but they practice, I guess, what I've started to call minimum viable governance in terms of acting as the the home for just enough legal bounds and just enough technical bounds between the domain name registrars to help ensure that your domain name registration is portable, that you can contest somebody else registering a domain name you don't like, that sort of thing, um, and that the system all works. And figuring out 
a good template for doing those kinds of things in the permission setting. Permission uh, blockchain space is something that's developed much more slowly than I expected it to. Uh, and, and something that perhaps we can address through open source software that helps automate it, but there's still like a human and legal processes thing, thing there that we haven't quite figured out how to do. And I think that's why we're participating in trust over IP on the governance stack. You know, I mean, those are the place to have good conversation. So Brian, thank you so much for your advice. John or, or Richard? Well, gosh, uh, I think that the the most important um, thing that I'm I, I, that we're, we're researching right now is just how things go wrong between companies that are trying to work together, and and what are the consequences of that? What is it costing us? What is it costing us to hedge against it in terms of sureties and uh, and uh, you know make good uh, holding you know uh, contra accounts uh, against the probability of something going wrong and you have a make good event that sort of thing. It, it's an it's an astronomical number. Um, one of the things that uh, we've we, we've got a number of huge brands like Coca-Cola and uh, ServiceNow that are baselining their systems with other with their suppliers and their and their buyers. And the, the reason, for example, that Coke is doing this is uh, Coca-Cola, Coke One North America's bottlers. Um, this is this is you know uh, just the, the bulk of the bottling of Coca-Cola uh, products across the North American sector. Um, is you know some of them are on SAP, some of them actually are using a fabric uh, uh, shared database. Uh, <laughs> some of them are using um, you know uh, Excel spreadsheets and uh, in QuickBooks and other things. So to be able to say my debit is definitely your credit, uh, my invoice is definitely your invoice that we have the same one, uh, and that the things that led up to that, and we we use zero knowledge proofs rather than than uh, off chain zero knowledge circuits rather than um, on-chain smart contracts to enforce this, uh, uh, enforce correctness, uh, and, and, and enforce workflow integrity, right? So, you, so not everybody knows about, you know, so, but at the end of the day, I've got an invoice. I want to sell that invoice. I want to. I want to securitize the invoice, and the people that are going to give me the money so that I don't have to wait ninety days or hundred days or longer for my uh, re for for the for my uh, receivable, um, they are more confident that they're going to collect because there's less likelihood of disputes. There's less likelihood that they're not going to get paid. That is a major sea change. Imagine, and this is where public and private come together. You've got a private database, SAP, what have you. You have a public blockchain that's selling, you know, that's securitizing invoices uh, on something like Ethereum on an ERC twenty, where that 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 invoice that that security, um, that uh, that token doesn't tell any tales. Doesn't say that to Wal Walmart's. John, thank you so much. I, I do see that we're one minute over. So Richard, you're gonna have to email me your suggestions and thank you for answering the q and Thank you for being on top of that. So so with that, uh, Dr. Nassim, do you have any concluding comments before we sign off? Uh, no, um, excellent session. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, we uh, I, I just want to, in the next session, we are going to officially um, elect Mr. John Wolpert to the fellowship of the <laughs> British Blockchain Association. We, 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 we do it every year uh, in person, but uh, this year because of COVID, um, we couldn't do it. So I know that he has to leave. So I just want to officially uh, elect him and welcome him uh, to the fellowship of the association. And um, the next session, we are going to announce the name of the best uh, abstract uh, award winners. So please do stay with us. And then after that, we have uh, our closing keynote from uh, Hester Pierce uh, from SEC. So thank you very much, uh, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.